Good morning. Is this working? Great. Yeah, it's great to be back with you. Great to see you, Jose. Uh, great to um, be back in this place. I, I, I pray for you guys regularly. I'm eagerly watching to see what happens at this, uh, this moment in your church's uh, life. I'm um, I really believe there needs to be a gospel witness in this neighborhood, and I just praying that uh, God um, does some great things um, here in, in McKinley Park and continues to use this place as a, a lighthouse with the good news. It's very, very much needed. And uh, I hope to encourage you all today with this, uh, this story uh, from Exodus chapter 2. Exodus is a great book for you guys to be in at this time. Um, for, for many, many reasons, but one of them is that it reminds us that God does big things, right? God uh, has done and can do great things. But it also reminds us that his timetable is often not our timetable, <laughs> that his, his work uh, it, it happens in unpredictable unplanned. You can't, it, it's not always the way we would script it, but it's a better, a better script, right? So this, this book of Exodus uh, has, a, we have to remember, it has a lot of waiting in it. The people of Israel had been waiting in Egypt for 400 years when this book of Exodus kicks off. There's a 400-year gap between the end of Genesis and the beginning of Exodus, and that puts a little bit of perspective, right, to our sense of hurry for God to, to move, right? We want him to move now. And he's on the move, and he's working, and he's doing great things, but it's often, it often has lots of waiting <laughs> in it. So Exodus is, is volume two of a five-part series. It's book two out of five. It continues the story that was started in Genesis, the story of a, of a world created and then fallen and then engaged with by God. Uh, most specifically in Genesis chapter 11 when God engages with this man named Abraham and makes grand promises to Abraham to make him into a great people and put him in this great land and through this to bless the whole world. It's a grand plan, right? Based on big promises. Well, here they are 400 years later. They're not in the promised land. In fact, they're suffering under a yoke of slavery. And at the end of chapter 1, we see that the seed of Abraham became the target of genocide. The, the Pharaoh that didn't remember Joseph, right, comes along and sees the Israelites as a threat, and he tries to kill all the Hebrew baby boys. That's what you looked at last week, right? So these are dark times. These are times when it seems like, where are you, God? Where's the unfolding of your promises? What are you doing? But God was working during those 400 years. The people of Israel had multiplied greatly. They'd become a great, they went down 70 people into Egypt 400 years ago. Now they're hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, even though it looked bleak, God was moving. And Abraham's offspring was becoming exceedingly great. And God's plan was progressing, even though it didn't always look like it. And even though it was being actively opposed by evil, it was still progressing. And just when things seemed hopeless, God was ironically at work to bring salvation. That's what today's story is about. And he's done that again and again and again and again throughout history. Um, and we're waiting for him to do it one more time. And he will when Christ shall come, as we just sang. There's one great event left, and we're waiting, and we're waiting, but God's proven himself faithful, and he, he will move. Even if things look bleak, even if the people of God seem weak, God is working out his plan, and he's going to act again, and we can have faith. So let me pray one more time for us, and then we'll, we'll look through this text together. Oh, Father, open the eyes of our hearts to to see, uh, to see your work in history and to have faith in you that, you, that you are still the God of history, the God of ages, the, the, the one who has been faithful 
and that we would trust you in this moment, in our moment of time, that you would uh, bless this church, Lord, that you would encourage them to keep their, their eyes on you, to, to, to not lose heart, to keep faith, to know that you are building your church, that your kingdom is advancing, even though it may not look like it in some ways. But I pray that you would encourage, encourage your church, encourage these saints, and use me today to do that. And um, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the problem with being a guest speaker at a church when I'm kind of part of a series that you guys are already going through is that uh, I don't know where you've been exactly, and I should have done my homework because the guy who's preaching next week, he asked me, oh, what are you going to, he asked me a couple days ago, what are you going to be doing? Can you let me know? And I was like, I should have done that with with Brock last week to know exactly what he had already covered. I, uh, I was in Indianapolis this past week for a conference, the Gospel Coalition Conference, and they had uh, three days of preaching, and they were going through the book of Hebrews, and there was different speakers each time, and there was uh, this one speaker who, who gave this really powerful illustration of hope. He told this story, and he told it in a very dramatic way. I'm not going to give you the whole unfolding of the details, but basically it was about this lab experiment that was done on rats. Um, where they took these rats, they put them in buckets, and they started to fill the buckets up with water, and they, they watched the rats um, treading water, and they timed them, and I guess they did this you know, with many rats, and they found that, that, that consistently, the rats always gave up around 20 minutes. They just gave up trying, and they, they lost hope, right? But then they had this other group of rats that right before the 20-minute threshold, they would um, pick the rats up out of the water, and grab them and hold them and give them a, a break. And then they put them back in the water and let them tread water. And they'd watch to see around 20 minutes what happened. 20 minutes came, they kept treading. An hour, two hours, three hours, four hours, I think it was like 17, 20 hours these rats kept treading water because they had experienced rescue and they had hope. Fascinating story, isn't it? Like amazing, amazing uh, illustration of, of the need for hope. And that if you know that there's rescue coming, you can keep going, right? Well, that, that preacher told that story, and the next night, there was a different preacher, and he started to, to do his, his message, and then he, he came to the theme of hope, and he started to tell an illustration to illustrate this theme of hope, and he said, there was once this experiment with lab rats, and I thought, is this a joke? Is he telling, I mean, is he like kind of like playing off of this dramatic story the guy told last night? But no, he kept going. He tells the same story again, and everybody around us is like, no, he's not doing this. Is it? He's telling the same illustration that the guy used the night before because he wasn't there. He wasn't paying attention, or, or, or so he didn't know they had been used before. <laughs> it, was just, it was just really funny. And so maybe I'm going to say the same thing that was said last week. I, I don't know. Forgive me if I do. Take it as a, as a reminder uh, that we need to hear again. But, um, so I don't know what you, you covered exactly or what the angle was in Exodus chapter 1, so, uh, but here we go. You have to understand that what's going on with this plot in chapter 1 to kill all the Hebrew baby boys is not just a tragic uh, story of political... Uh, oppress, oppression, it's actually satanic. It's satanic. Did Brock t- touch on that a little bit? Okay. This is the work of Satan. Remember Exodus is book two out of five, right? It's part of a five-part series. So you kinda, it's really one book in five parts. Uh, so you got to know what happens in Genesis to understand what's going on in Exodus. Way back at the beginning of Genesis, there was that ancient serpent, the devil, right? The enemy of God and God's people. Satan goes by many different names, but he hates God. He hates God's people. He tempted God's people to sin in that first sin. And after that happens, there's this declaration from God that there would be perpetual enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent that there'd be this constant friction, this battle of good and evil that, 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 there would, that would continue throughout the generations. Satan would be trying to thwart God's plan of redemption at every turn. Everything he could, he would do everything he could to attack and destroy God's people. But one day, there was this promise, Genesis 3.15, that one day, one would come from the seed of the woman that would finally destroy Satan. There would be an end 
Now, Satan takes on many different forms. He in, in gets in in many different ways into this world and works in his, in his evil ways. And here, what we find in Exodus is the person of Pharaoh is a manifestation of that ancient serpent and his animosity toward God. Satan is behind this. This is Satan's attempt to destroy the line of God's promised people. He's trying to stamp out the seed of the woman, the seed of Abraham, the seed of God's promise from which is to come his ultimate destroyer. destroyer. And Satan uh, and his forces of evil are in a heightened state of activity in this holocaust that's happening in Exodus chapter 1. Right? You have Pharaoh who's positioned himself as a god. Right? He, 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 he is rivaling, trying to rival the one true God. And he's having all the sons of God's people thrown into the Nile River. That's satanic. In, in the book of Revelation, it's um, the last book in the Bible. It kind of comes at things from a different angle. It kind of peels back the, uh, the, what we see and kind of shows you the unseen realities behind that. And there's this symbolic picture of this very kind of thing in Revelation chapter 12 where there's this enormous red dragon standing in front of a woman that's about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. That's the spiritual reality. It's a cosmic battle that's, that's, that's at work in this world. It's the, it's the unseen reality behind what we see everywhere. And that's what's going on behind the scenes with Pharaoh and God's covenant people in Egypt. In attempting to eliminate the offspring of the woman, the chosen people of God, says uh, commentator John McKay, Pharaoh and all Egypt with him are acting as Satan's pawns. Satan's desperately trying to thwart God's plan, attack God's people. And that's the end of chapter 1. So now we come to chapter 2, what was just read for us by Ron. You have this intense spiritual battle going on. And in the face of these high stakes and this opposition to God and God's people, God's people continue to live by faith and continue to trust that God's good and he's at work. So think of the faith that it took for an ordinary man to marry a, a young woman from his tribe and decide to, to start a family during a climate like this, right? But that's what chapter 2, verse 1 tells us happened. Now a man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman continued to, to do the things, to, 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 to not give up hope, right? Sometimes this last year, this world has felt like it's like cra- cra- crazy, right? Like, what is going on? And, and I'm like, why, what, what's my kid's future going to be like? What kind of world are they going to live in? I can get kind of fearful and scared and thinking about things and wonder, like, why would anybody want to have kids, you know? Bring them into this world. Well, think about what's happening in in Exodus chapter 1, in that kind of world. And yet, God's people are still trusting God. They have faith. They're moving forward. They're being fruitful and multiplying. They're trusting the Lord. It's a great, great picture of faith. Chapter 2, verse 2, the woman conceived and bore a son. And that, that phrase, she conceived and bore a son, is a, is a familiar phrase through the book of Genesis. Um, it occurs 15 times in the book of Genesis. But this is the last time we see that phrase in the Pentateuch. Pentateuch is a way of talking about the first five books of the Bible. So 15 times in the book of Genesis. It happens here in Exodus chapter 2, and then it never happens again. Why? Because there's an anticipation, there's an expectation, there's a, a realization that this baby is something special, right? Right? There's something unique about this one. Could he be the one? Could he be the seed that's going to finally end the battle and destroy Satan? And there's that sense of anticipation here. The text says, when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him three months. Now, every mother thinks their baby's beautiful, right? Like, every every mom thinks their baby's a fine child. But there was something extra special 
about this baby. And in the New Testament book of Hebrews, chapter 11, comments on the astounding faith of this baby's parents. It says, by faith, they hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child. And they were not afraid of the king's edict. They trusted that somehow God's plan was progressing even though it was being directly countered by evil. They, they, there was a sense that, something, that God was doing something special here. I don't know how they got that or how that was confirmed to them, but the text tells us that's what happened. <clears throat> so they hid him for three months. But when they could hide him no longer, verse 3, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes, that's uh, papyrus stalks, and uh, daubed it with bitumen and pitch. May not seem like a very significant detail, but when the Bible gives you details, you, you, you have to think, what's that there for? And it actually, it actually is very significant. The word that's used here for basket is only used in one other context in the whole Old Testament. You know where that's at? It's in the flood narrative in Genesis chapter 6 verse to, to chapter 9. And the word is actually the word ark. This is an ark. So just like Noah's ark, right? This ark is water sealed with pitch, right? Just like Noah's ark provided deliverance for the seed of the woman, a place of safety for Noah and his family, this little ark was going to do the same thing for this notable figure. It was going to provide him safety from the waters. It was going to preserve his life so that he could grow up to provide deliverance for the seed of the woman. It's a, it's a little miniature ark. Now, can you imagine the faith that it took, the faith that's represented by this baby's mom to take her little child, three-month-old, and put him in this tiny little basket, this little ark, and leave him on the river? What trust in God. And that's what she did. She had no other choice. So she makes this mini Noah's Ark and she trusts. And the baby's older sister stays nearby the, the banks and kind of follows it to see what would happen. And then this strange twist in the story. Of all people, Pharaoh's daughter, with her attendants, came by that particular section of the river at that particular moment and went down in by those very reeds for a bath. And then she spots this basket and she sends one of her slave girls to, to go get it and she opens it and there's a crying Hebrew baby. How'd she know it was a Hebrew baby? It was circumcised, right? What would she do? Would she kill it like her dad had commanded? Should be done? No. She took pity on him, the text says. She had compassion. Suddenly, the baby's sister pops up out of the, the side of the, the banks of the river and, and, and volunteers to go find a wet nurse for this little baby. And in this, again, weird, ironic twist, the baby's mom gets paid to nurse her own son, right? And after he gets weaned, which could possibly be like age four, you could, you could nurse a child till around age four back then, which means Moses would have been old enough to be instructed in the, the stories um, of his people. He learned them from his mother when he was a little, little lad. So probably around age four, he gets uh, adopted by Pharaoh's daughter. Uh, to receive all the benefits of the royal household, education, uh, protection, etc. And she names him Moses, which means I have drawn him out of the water. And that's the beginning of the story of this man named Moses, which is going to take up the rest of the Pentateuch, right? All the way through Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. A uh, major towering figure in the Bible. That's the beginning of it. Some would say, this sounds mythical. This sounds too much like other sort of ancient Near Eastern uh, birth narratives of national heroes. There's something kind of similar in, in, with Sargon in that mythology. So um, some people say this, this didn't really happen, but it's really hard to prove literary borrowing with stuff like this. And the Exodus account is distinct enough and it's plausible enough. 
And given the fact that many babies in ancient times were exposed and abandoned for various reasons, it's not surprising to find many stories like that. But this, this one is, it rings true. It rings true because it sounds exactly like the, the way God works in other ways other places. It's, it, it's the, the irony of evil that we've come to expect in God's uh, unfolding narrative that you've, you see over and over again, even already in the book of Genesis, the way that God deals with the devil. Satan, in attempting to thwart God's plans, actually ends up defeating himself. <laughs> evil is evil. I'm not saying that evil is somehow good and some kind of Zen, Buddhist nonsense, right? Evil is evil. We have to be very clear about that. But it's still, in some mysterious way, God is sovereign even over evil without in any way being the author of it himself. He's not caught by surprise. He, he actually predicted these 400 long, hard years in Egypt way back in Genesis 15, 13. He called it. He knew this was going to happen. And he had a plan. He had a beautiful plan to work good out of evil to incorporate this ancient serpent's vile schemes into his story of redemption, kind of like a judo expert or a chess master or um, the, the scientist who discovered penicillin from mold, right? They took something gross and worked good out of it. And so what you have happening here is the harder that Pharaoh tries to squash the Israelites, to keep them down, the stronger they grow, Right? It must be maddening for the devil. It must be, he must just be getting more and more irate. For example, Pharaoh's plan of genocide included the preservation of daughters, probably for some diabolical reason. Kill all the men, we'll keep the girls for ourselves, right? But as things turned out, it was daughters who were its downfall, observes Alec Motir, another scholar, it's women like Shifra and Pua. It's Moses' mom, Moses' sister. And then even, ironically, Pharaoh's daughter. It's women that subvert the strategy. One scholar remarks how Pharaoh wishes to counter God's plan by casting infants into the Nile. But God saves Moses by casting him onto the Nile and bringing him to Pharaoh's front door. Irony of ironies, right? God's people are supposed to be annihilated by the Nile. Get it? Annihilated. Yeah. But instead, one very special boy gets drawn out of the water, down by the reeds, and he ends up being the one who draws God's people out of Egypt through the waters of the, the Yam Suf, which is commonly called the Red Sea, but literally it means Sea of Reeds, same word. There's just ironies everywhere. This story is, 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 is magnificent in how God is doing it. God's plan is progressing, even when it's being directly countered by evil, sometimes, somehow, precisely by the heinous attacks of the evil one. Satan's trying to destroy the seed, and the seed's growing. And all these ironies are happening. You see this irony also at the end of Genesis in the story of Joseph, right? Right? When his brothers wickedly beat him to within an inch of his life, they sell him as a slave. A horrific evil. Awful. But in God's providence, it resulted in Joseph going on ahead of God's people to rise to the position where he could preserve their lives from starvation and preserve the line from extinction. And in the end, Joseph told his brothers, he said this, As for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. That's how God works. And this Old Testament story in Exodus 2 is, is, is really just a, a, a little echo of the overarching story of the world, right? Ever since the very beginning, the ancient serpent in the garden, Satan has been seeking to sway human history towards his evil ends. He's seeking to dethrone God, but it hasn't worked. God's plan has prevailed. A descendant of Eve, 
that would crush the serpent's head was prophesied in Genesis 3.15. So was a continuing battle where the serpent would do everything he could to prevent this from happening. So you have, right from the very beginning, Abel is the first victim. He's murdered by his brother. That's, that's uh, Satan's work, right? But then the line of Seth comes. And out of the line of Seth, the promise continues down into the, the line of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And that line faces opposition at every turn. They face opposition from famines, from pharaohs, from Philistines, right? And the promise eventually, it continues. It eventually narrows down to the the line of David. So Seth to Abraham to Isaac to Jacob and on down into the line of David, which just barely escapes eradication, by the evil King Ahab's daughter, Athaliah. You can read all the intrigue in 2 Kings chapter 11, a fascinating story. It was hanging on by a thread, almost entirely ended by a little boy was kind of kept hidden, hidden (laughs) for a little while. There are men like Haman in the book of Esther, another fascinating narrative, right, who come this close to wiping out the Jews, but ironically ends up getting hanged on his own gallows. This is how God works. It's the irony of evil. And then there's this man named Herod. You heard of him? You've heard of him, right? He's maniacal, power hungry. He was evil. And that story starts with another young woman of extraordinary faith, like Moses' mom. Her name is Mary. And hers is the last and the most amazing in a a long line of miraculous and momentous conceptions in the Bible. She's not just barren uh, and and conceives and bears a son. She's a virgin. And she becomes pregnant and she gives birth to a son, a, a very extra special son indeed. Because this one turns out to be the one, right? The seed of the woman the seed of Abraham, the son of David, the Messiah. And in the birth of Jesus, the time has come, the greatest act of deliverance, the greatest exodus from slavery, the greatest defeat of evil is about to happen, that everything else in all the Old Testament has been setting up and and leading towards. God has come in human flesh to rescue humanity. And Satan tries, he tries yet again to stop it. He knows that that this is big and momentous and he's doing everything, he unleashes all of his tactics. He tries everything. You can read about it in Matthew chapter two. Some magi see a star and they figure out a king of the Jews has been born. They come to honor him. They go to the palace first, of course, to find out that... uh, where this king has been born, and they find King Herod. Herod doesn't know what they're talking about. In fact, he's quite disturbed by this idea. He asks his experts in the law where the Messiah was supposed to be born. They all tell him Bethlehem, so he sends the Magi there uh, to search for the baby, to report back to him where he is, supposedly, so he can go worship him. But they find the baby Jesus. They know Herod's intentions are not right. They skip town without telling Herod. He gets irate. He's enraged. And just like Pharaoh... In Exodus chapter 2, or Exodus chapter 1, when he's duped by the the midwives, right? We read in Matthew chapter 2 that when Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the timetable he'd learned from the Magi. You see what's going on? You see the repetition here? This This is the same kind of story. Herod is another man of history who's aligned with evil, Satan is behind it. It's his last frantic attempt. He's a man through which the devil is trying to stop God's plan. But Herod's attempts only forced Jesus' parents to go down into Egypt so that Jesus could come up out of Egypt, so that Jesus could recapitulate Israel's exodus out of Egypt. I called my son. You see, there's a... There's a a grand story here that God is is doing. Jesus, just like Moses, would come up out of Egypt, and later in life, he would come up out of the waters of baptism. He'd spend 40 days in the wilderness. The parallels are just all over the place. But the greatest parallel 
is the example of evil's greatest irony. Satan tried everything, right? He tried to kill Jesus as a baby. He tried to tempt him in, in the desert. He opposed him. Um, he tried whatever he could. And he must have known that it was futile. But nevertheless, delirious with rage towards God, he entered into Judas, who betrayed Jesus to the leaders. And in the hour when darkness reigned, everything seemed to converge against Jesus. He was scorned, mocked, cheated of justice, beaten, tortured, and executed. His flesh was mutilated. His blood was drained as he was executed like a criminal on a Roman cross. And in that moment, Satan was drunk with ecstasy. Out of his mind with glee at what he thought he had accomplished. Finally, at last, he had ended the line. He'd taken out all of his aggression against God on God. And he thought he won. That was the apex of evil. It was the most wicked, despicable, awful thing in human history. And the irony is that it was also the apex of God's great plan of redemption. Satan, in trying to destroy Jesus, actually played right into his hand. What Satan thought was his greatest accomplishment was actually God's. You see, Jesus' death crushed the head of Satan. Just like Pharaoh wanted Moses thrown into the Nile, yet his being cast there actually turned out for his deliverance and eventually Pharaoh's defeat. Satan wanted Jesus plastered on a cross, yet his being put there actually turned out for our deliverance and Satan's defeat. It was Jesus' triumph because there... He took on himself the punishment that his people deserved for being complicit with Satan in the garden. And he made a way for Satan's work to be undone without compromising in any way God's integrity, God's righteousness, God's justice, because if God had done that, Satan would have won. Wicked men put Jesus to death by nailing him to the cross, but it was by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, Acts 2.23. And even though it was grotesque, it was a beautiful plan. Jesus took the full brunt of God's righteous fury at evil upon himself in the place of his people so that his people could be exonerated from their evil and God's character could be maintained and we could be freed from our slavery. We could be God's people in God's place again. Just when things seemed hopeless, That's when God's ironically at work to bring salvation. We see it all throughout the Bible. And so, what's that mean for us today? It means we can have faith. We can trust, as we've seen this this theme, this motif, just keep repeating itself throughout the Bible and reach this grand climax in Jesus. We can have faith as we live in this world, but it looks so evil Looks like Satan's still wreaking havoc. Where are you, where, where are you working, God? It's been 2,000 years. There's waiting. There's questions. There's suffering. We can have faith, despite our circumstances, despite all the evil around us, that God's promise to build his church is progressing It is progressing and Christ will come again to finally rescue his people and remove Satan and evil entirely. We can trust, we can trust that God's plan is moving forward despite all the hardships, all the obstacles and the opposition. Even these crazy times, like these are crazy times, aren't they? What a year. If you would have told me a year and a half ago that there would be a, a season where most of the churches in Chicago didn't meet for a whole year? Would you have believed that? That's just, it's still, if I think about it, it's just mind-boggling. Satan, that sounds like Satan would love that. That's how can I keep God's people from meeting? How can I shut down churches for a year? But I, I believe in the face of all this craziness that God's still working 
that God's even ironically gonna use this to purify and strengthen his church, to work in us, to, to cause our faith to grow, that his church is gonna prevail, that, that it's, not, it's not gonna die out. <laughs> It'll be here when Christ comes back. So keep your eyes on him, keep your faith in him, keep trust in his promises. This is how he works in the times when things seem darkest and hope, most hopeless. When evil seems to be prevailing, ironically, God is working in, in unexpected ways. And his plans cannot be thwarted. Let's pray. Lord, help us, help us. Help us to believe this truth that is so clearly here in the pages of Scripture. That we have an enemy of our souls who's trying to do everything he can. He's thrashing around trying to steal, kill, and destroy get our eyes off of you, but you are working and you are more powerful and your plan is better. And I pray that you have brought us here today for this very moment, for this very passage, that you would encourage us, that you would not let us give up. Just uh, your, your work throughout history to redeem and rescue would give us hope. Help us to keep waiting. Lord, help us to know that you're working. Pray for anyone here today who's faith is not in Christ, that you would have brought them here to bring them to life and to bring them to repentance and faith. We pray that your spirit is working through this, this small little church, Lord, in ways that um, outwit the world, that confuse the world, that your power is made perfect in weakness and that you're getting glory for yourself. And... and um, we trust that you're, you're working, Lord. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.